This is probably the largest audience to ever hear a lecture about microRNAs. I am willing to take questions. I'm more than willing to take questions. I love to answer questions. Out of all billion people, you're the last one. <laughs> uh, so my question is, is there any instance or reported instance that in which the mutation in Agar 2 is bringing about the same effect where uh, microRNA breakdown occurs in cancers or some other pathogenesis. Because there are some reported instances which shows that the role of microRNA is simply to guide the ego 2 to the mRNA. And if you artificially tether that by lambda N peptide or Box B, you have the same effect. So ego 2 mutations, can they bring out the same thing as a breakdown of microRNA does? You know what? There are people in this audience who know a lot more about aspects of microRNAs than I do. <laughs> um, and <laughs> you're one of them. <laughs> How do we age? And I'm not thinking particularly of can we live forever or something like that. I'm thinking what's the quality of life? What's the health of this person as such an individual ages? What goes on during age, aging that makes somebody's life as they age, a good life or, or a more difficult life. I started my career as a surgeon, but I now don't see any patients. I had two reasons to uh, quit uh, surgery. Uh, the one reason, the first reason, was that I was not so good at uh, surgery. <laughs> the second reason was that uh, even, I found, even a very, very good surgeon cannot, cannot help many patients suffering from various, uh, various diseases and injuries. What I'd like to do today is share with you the story that got me to move from the clinic to the lab. And hopefully through that story, you will see how important basic research is for us to understand human disorders. And also, of course, how important is uh, catching on medical clues to pursue research. I think the two really interact. It took 16 years to find the Rett syndrome genes. And today, if I was to see my first patient with Rett syndrome, and I would like to pursue finding the gene, I will be able to find it in two months. The human genome, 23 chromosome pairs, 3 billion letters of DNA. A typical gene is 3,000 letters. A typical mutation in the gene is one letter. It'd be like finding a needle in a haystack. generate that sequence of letters? What do you use to scan it or...? What a great question! <laughs> Thank you! So I'm a psychiatrist, but I'm also a neuroscientist, and I uh, am interested in both the natural processes that make the brain uh, so wonderful, but also uh, I'd like to at least uh, help understand how it goes wrong and how it might be treated specifically. How long is, does the effect last? Because from a therapeutic point of view, um, I know right here when you switch the light on and off, the effect is immediate. But um, if you wanted the effect to last, how would we go about it? That's a great question, and it's a very important one. We can in some cases get uh, lasting effects. What you can see here is this uh, extinction 
of the acute fear response while we're delivering light. But then on a third day, there's no light at all, but we still see a small but statistically significant reduction in the fear response a day later, even though there's no active stimulation going on. So there's an extinction memory that's been formed and it's still detectable a day later. The fact that that occurred even when we weren't even really trying suggests that this is a plastic pathway, that if you, there might be ways and likely are ways to recruit its innate ability to be plastic and give rise to lasting effects. My assignment for today is to tell you the story of inherited breast and ovarian cancer, how we sorted out that story, what the roles of the genes BRCA1 and its sister BRCA2 and the other sister genes are, and what impact knowing that information has had for women, for their physicians, and for their families. Uh, you pointed out that the a uh, age from MENA to childbearing, so w what is the age range where these uh, uh, families were affected? Breast cancer is unique in that it is, a, it is a cancer of prosperity. Most cancers are not, most diseases are not, but breast cancer is. It's a cancer of being, it's, it's a consequence of our being the most successful mammals there have ever been. I mean, there is no mammal as successful as a female human. I mean, <laughs> we have. <laughs> I'm going to talk about a very hard problem today, the problem of emotion. And part of the reason that it's a hard problem is that people can't even agree on the definition of the word emotion. Part of the reason for that is that emotion is such a fascinating topic that it attracts researchers from many different disciplines, from psychiatry, from psychology, from neuroscience, from philosophy, from physics and none of them can agree on exactly what it is. It's like the proverbial blind men grasping at an elephant. They're all touching the same thing, but they don't know exactly what to call it. The so classical physiology always discuss about VMH as a satiety center. So, but now you are discussing more of the aggressive behavior. Yes, so very interesting question. So VMH has been uh, a target uh, of study in the, in the metabolism field and the control of satiety. Uh, if in fact there used to be uh, psychiatric experiments where people would try to lesion VMH as a treatment for obesity. Uh, and all of this is true. And so we're looking now in our single cell RNA-seq to see if that's because there's another population of neurons in that region which is controlling uh, metabolism and feeding behavior, which is mixed together with the social behavior neurons, or whether something more complicated is going on. Very good question. What I'm going to talk to you about today, you heard about, which is the genetic disorders of dietary excess. And I'm going to talk about two such disorders. Um, I had one question related to the mutant localizing to the lipid droplet and that increasing the abundance of the lipid. So are you uh, alluding to this protein? Uh, because there is an accumulation of this protein, lipases not getting, because this is a mutant protein, so are there yes, lipases good. not getting to that, to the lipid droplet, or is there? Well, it's a very good question, and I couldn't show you. We've done a lot of experiments. That was our first hypothesis. Maybe the accumulation of this protein, maybe it knocks off the lipases that normally are, are involved in mobilization of uh, fatty acids from the droplet. That's not the case. That is not the case. The other lipases are, and you saw the amounts of the lipases are exactly the same, and there is no, uh, there's no d difference. We even look to see whether or not maybe there is a, one of the lipases, ATGL, has a cofactor, which is CGI58. And one of our thoughts, PLA3, it makes the droplets very large, and maybe 
you actually, the, the lipase is on the larger droplets or, or, and that its cofactor now is on the smaller droplets, we, that's not the case. We don't see any difference in the distribution of those two things. We are, we're actively working on trying to figure out why it is that accumulation of this protein causes, uh, uh, it, it seems to interfere with, with uh, mobilization of, of the fatty acids. It's Thank a very you. good question. There's a famous cartoon by XKCD, you know, which, which shows, shows, you know, psychologists uh, sneering at sociologists. They're saying they're applied sociologists. And biologists saying psychologists are merely applied biologists. And chemists saying they're biologists merely applied chemists. And physicists saying, oh, chemists are merely applied physicists. And then at the, separately somewhere, they're mathematicians. And I think, <laughs> And what I think of string theorists is that they're sort of wannabe mathematicians. <laughs> so, anyway, <laughs> sorry. <laughs>